to Science at the Museum. My name is Sierra and I'm an educator right here at DMNS. Today, we'll be exploring the science of space. We call that astronomy. You know, one important thing in science, no matter what kind, is how we sort things that are alike into groups. So as you listen today, be paying attention to how we categorize things in space, like planets. Are they rocky, like Earth or Mars? Or are they big balls of gas, like Jupiter and Saturn? A group of planets that orbit the same star are a solar system. And a group of nearby solar systems are a galaxy. What sort of things do you have at home that you could sort into groups or categories, like a scientist? If you're ready to explore space science with us, strap in your spaceship seatbelt and get ready to blast off in three, Two, one. Thanks, Sierra, for getting us started on our exploration of space today. Now, have any of you ever wondered if cookies or cocoa could help us learn about space? Well, believe it or not, they can. And Amanda is going to show us how next. All right, hey guys, I'm back. We're gonna be learning about the phases of the moon now. Um, so this is one of my favorite kind of science lessons because it's actually an edible science lesson. A good rule in science is we never eat or drink our science experiments unless somebody tells us it's okay to do that. Um, and on this one, it's gonna be okay. But before we get into the actual activity, uh, let's talk a little bit about the phases of the moon. Uh, First of all, the moon doesn't generate its own light, right? The moon gets light from the sun and reflects it back uh, to us here on Earth. So it's kind of like a giant mirror uh, up in space. Now, what phase of the moon we see is determined by where that moon is in its orbit around the Earth and where we are as we sit here on the Earth. So we're gonna pretend like we all live on this smiley face's nose. This is the Earth. We live right there, right where the nose is. Here's my moon, all right? We always see the same side of the moon. So a good way to, uh, to understand that is if you get a friend, uh, an adult, a brother or a sister, um, you're gonna stand face to face with them and I want you to put your hands on their shoulders and they're gonna do the same. They're gonna put their hands on your shoulders. And all I want you guys to do is just rotate. So you guys are going to orbit each other, all right? Um, do you ever see the backside of your partner? No, you're always looking right at their face and the same thing, uh, happens with the moon. So we're always looking at the same side of the moon. We don't ever see the back, this backside. All right, so where it's at in that orbit determines what phase of the moon we see. So sometimes we see a banana shape, sometimes we see a pizza shape, sometimes we look up in the sky and there is no moon at all. It's not that it's not there, the sun is just reflecting off the backside of the moon, so we don't see it. All right. Um, so, let's go ahead and get down to it, all right? Edible science lessons, yay! We are gonna do moon phases with cookies, all right? We all know these cookies, we all love these cookies. I'm cheating, I was hungry. Let's actually do the activity. So this is a sheet that you can find on NASA's website, in their kids' website. So if you go to spaceplace.nasa.org, you'll be able to find this, this worksheet. And this can kind of walk you guys through this activity that we're doing right now. So I'm gonna put that down. You gotta swallow now. And we're gonna use Oreo cookies to actually make our moon phases. So if the sun is here, and we're right here on Earth, the sun will be hitting the backside of the moon. That 
the, what we call the dark side of the moon. So it'll be hitting that side. When we look up into the sky, we won't actually see the moon. That is called the new moon. So to make the new moon, you're just going to pull off one side of the cookie. Make sure there's no cream on this side. And you're going to stick it right there under the new moon, or on top of the new moon. The next one we're going to see is there's waxing and waning. One way I like to uh, think about that is when I say waxing, it sounds a little bit like maxing. And we max out on something, we're getting bigger, we're getting more. So a waxing moon means we're going to start seeing more and more of it. So waxing is going to be moving this way. When we get to this point, we're going to see a moon called a waxing crescent. That's when we see that banana-shaped moon. So to make that one, you're going to pull off ooh, a cookie. And you're going to scrape off a banana shape. The cream is my favorite part, so this is really hurting me to put this to the side. All right, so here we have our banana-shaped waxing crescent moon. All right, so we have that shape. The next shape we're going to see is our first quarter. It's going to look like half a moon, but remember, it's not half a moon because that moon is round. So what you're actually seeing is one quarter of the moon. So to make our quarter, we're going to need another cookie with cream. And we're going to cut off half of that cream. I'm going to eat all of this as soon as I'm done, just so you know. So here we have our first quarter moon. You can glue these onto a piece of paper if you wanted, but then you're not going to be able to eat them. Don't eat glue. That's not okay. All right, so we're going to start getting bigger. Right now we're at the quarter moon, right, the waxing quarter. We're going to start to see more of it. We're going to see what's called a waxing gibbous moon. And a gibbous moon isn't quite full, but it's getting there, all right? I'm going to try and peel this off carefully because we need all of the cream for this one, a majority of it. So you're going to gently pull the top of that cookie off. I find that double stuff Oreos work really well for this one. Just because the pop, the, the top se seem to pop off a little bit easier. I'm going to smear it around. And I'm going to mold it to what I want it to be, which is three, oh no, three quarters. Looks kind of rough. Sorry, guys. But you can tell it's not quite, not quite full. We still have a little bit more to go. So there's our waxing gibbous. And now, if you look, here we are. The moon's going to be here, right? We're getting the full light from the sun. So that's, what we're, that's when we're going to see that full moon. All right? So let's get another cookie. This may seem like a colossal waste of cookies, but it's not. All right, there's our full moon. Came off nice and easy. So now that we've done the waxing, we've gotten bigger, bigger, bigger until we've gotten to our full moon. Now we're going to start getting smaller again. When our moon starts getting smaller, that's called waning. So the next one, if this was the waxing gibbous, this one's going to start to get smaller. It's called the waning gibbous. So we'll get another cookie. I'm just going to get a bunch of them out. All right. Now they're coming off nice and clean. So for the waning gibbous, I'm again going to cut off, this time like cut off a banana shape. There you go. So here comes that waning gibbous. Turn it upside down. All right, so we have our waning gibbous. Now we're going to move closer. This is going to get us to our third quarter moon, third quarter. So, take that cream, cut it in half, scrape half of it off, 
and eat it. Here's our third quarter moon. All right, our next one, waning crescent, so our banana-shaped moon. I seriously can't wait to eat all of these. All right, so I'm going to carve off a banana or make it look like a banana at least. And here we go. And then we're back to that new moon. So if you wanted, you could put all of them on your paper. I lost my full moon already. I think I ate it. It's okay. There, there. You can match up your, your moon phases just like that. And there you go. You have the Oreo moon phases. And like I said, it's even better because it's edible. All right, guys, have fun. Get that sugar. Your adults are going to love it. Hey, everybody, my name is Amanda. I'm here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and we're going to be exploring craters today. So let's think about craters. What are they? I'm sure you've heard the word before, but what are they? Where do they come from? How do we get them? Um, so a crater is actually formed by a large object hitting another object. All right, so let's think a bit. Where do we find craters? Take about five seconds, and I want you guys to think about where we might find craters. If you're thinking the moon, I'm thinking you're right, all right? So we find lots of craters on our moon. All these little dents in the surface of our moon, those are all craters. Craters are caused by large space rocks hitting the surface of a, another object, all right? Do we have craters here on Earth? Sure we do. We just don't necessarily see them as well as we see them on the moon because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Our atmosphere, that protective bubble around our Earth, does a really good job of protecting the surface of our Earth from those giant objects like asteroids flying through space. Uh, but we do have them here on Earth. The asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, we discovered because we discovered that crater. All right, so we're gonna be doing a little experiment. I'm gonna show you a super simple thing that you guys can do at your house. I will tell you, it's a little bit messy which is what science is, all right? Science is messy, science is fun. So let me show you guys how to do this. All you're gonna need is a pie tin or some other sort of tin if your adults have a, a roasting pan. Check with them first, uh, but you can use one of those. We don't wanna leave craters in their nice dishes. The other thing you're gonna need is some flour or cornstarch, any kind of um, powdery substance that you have at your house. And then you'll need one uh, contrasting color. So for example, I'm using cocoa powder. If you don't have something like this, that's totally okay. You can, you can do this just with flour, all right? So when you make this little crater, crater dish, you're gonna pour the flour, let's hope, oh, already. You're gonna pour, pour the flour in the, tan, in the tin. Make sure you cover it the bottom completely, and then you're gonna take your hand and just kind of smooth it out, just like that. So you have a nice level surface. On top of that, if you do happen to have something uh, like cocoa powder at home, you're gonna take that, and you're going to sprinkle that right on top, and you're gonna cover that other layer. So you sprinkle it on top, and then you're pat it down a little bit. All right, add a little bit more on the edges here. All right, this contrasting color uh, powder is going to help you uh, make a little, uh, some better observations about your crater. So what happened with the flower? Like I said, you can do it without this. Um, this just is a good visual for you. Once you have this, you're going to need different size balls. So I have a baseball here, I have a golf ball, a ping pong ball, um, this little smiling happy face stress ball, okay? If you have access to rocks, I'm gonna use rocks today, 
okay? Now before you start doing this, uh, examine the balls that you have picked out. Uh, how much do they weigh? How big are they? Um, and then make predictions. Which one's going to leave the bigger crater? Uh, which one's going to leave a smaller crater? What happens when you drop it from way up here? What happens if I drop it from way down here? Or even at an angle? So I'm going to put this one to the side because I have a much larger, way more fun, way more messy one. Because who doesn't like to make a, a mess? I'm going to put my flour down here and my cocoa powder down here so we have plenty of room. And I'm going to use rocks instead of these guys. All right, my first rock, OK? Look at the size of this. It's got an odd shape, not uh, all asteroids are perfectly round. They're jagged. They're weirdly shaped, all right? And this one I'm going to drop from up here. Interesting. If I pull this guy out, it's a nice deep crater, right? But it's not very big. It's not very wide. It did a nice job of kind of making the same shape as this rock. I'm going to drop this. Where'd my smaller one go? See what happens when I throw stuff? I lose stuff. Let that be a lesson to you. All right, we're just going to go without it. I'm going to take this big one. You might recognize this from the mission control game. And I'm going to drop it from a much lower height. I'm going to drop it here. I'm going to pull it out. Notice that crater. All right, I'm going to drop this one from like way up here. Way up here. The explosion of powder, it got all over me. The higher I drop it, the heavier the object is, the bigger the crater and the more it's going to kind of spew all that powder um, all over the place. All right, I'm going to try one more. Oops, sorry. And I'm going to throw this one at an angle. All right, so I'm going to take this one. And because not all asteroids or not all meteorites fall straight down, a lot of the times they come in at angles. So I'm going to throw this one at an angle. Explosion. Mess. Your adult should be thrilled with this activity. But look at how it took all that powder and blasted it out that way. All right, so this is something that you guys can do at home, make that big mess, be curious about things, get different size rocks, different weight uh, rocks, and see what kind of creators you all can make at home. Um, you can also, we talked a lot about the uh, craters on the moon. If you go outside at night um, and you take a pair of binoculars, you can see ton of craters all over the surface of our moon. So here's the side of the moon that faces us, and you'll be able to see some of those craters when you look through the moon in your binoculars. All right, guys, stay curious, stay awesome, get messy. Well, Amanda certainly got me excited about our moon, what with those moon phases cookies and playing with the craters in that pan of cocoa. But did you know that Earth isn't the only planet in our solar system that has a moon? In fact, some of our planets have many moons. We're gonna go join Jose, Mitch, and Naomi as they fly out to one of the moons of Saturn. Its name is Titan. And there's an upcoming uh, NASA mission to Titan, um, which I always, Get the name wrong. It's either Dragonfly or Firefly or... Uh, <laughs> I think it's Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Or, horsefly, maybe. Horsefly. <laughs> so Titan is a fascinating uh, space in our universe because it is the only other place in the universe besides Earth that has solid, that has uh, liquid on the surface. It's got lakes and rivers. It has clouds and it rains there. But all of this liquid is not water like it is on Earth, because on Titan, your average surface temperature is about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is water there, but that water is frozen incredibly solid. But methane, like we had in the upper atmosphere of Neptune, reflecting back all that blue light, um, at these temperatures on Titan is actually a liquid. So there are lakes of liquid methane, and there 
there's rainstorms of methane raindrops. Um, and what's exciting is we're always looking for water out in space because the one place where there's water in our solar system, the planet Earth, is covered in life. And so maybe we need water for life in our universe. Maybe we just need that liquid cycle of lakes evaporating and forming clouds and raining back down. So this is a really interesting place to look to see what might be going on. I, this is a question that bothered me for a long time because you remember how Neptune was blue because of the methane in the atmosphere? Well, Titan is orange because of the methane in the atmosphere. Um, <laughs> which, I will which also is point out that the view we have is a little bit weird here because this isn't what we would see if we approached Titan on a spacecraft. It would just be a ball of orange. Um, yeah. you, it's looking a little bit redder, I think, than normal in this visualization because what we're allowing us to do in the planetarium is look through those clouds and actually be able to see some of the lakes, which are a very dark black color. So I think that's why we're seeing red more than orange. Yeah. So the big difference is on Titan, the gas is reflecting back blue light. On, uh, sorry, on Neptune. On Titan, something very different is happening. The high energy particles from the sun, we call those solar wind, uh, but the sunlight is interacting with the methane in the atmosphere and is actually breaking it apart. And when that happens, it actually releases kind of an orange smoke, sort of a byproduct of orange stuff. Um, so the atmosphere around uh, Titan is full of kind of orange smoky stuff. Before you have a planet or a solar system or a star, you have a big cloud of gas and dust. And then over hundreds and millions and billions of years, those clouds start to pull together. And the bigger an object gets, the more gravity it has, so it attracts more stuff to it. And when it gets big enough, um, and every time it attracts more stuff, it gets more energy. So it also gets really hot. Um, so when you get a big enough hot ball of stuff, it will become a moon. <laughs> That's the very basic version. And, you know, some moons, too, don't necessarily form with their planets. They might form somewhere else in the solar system and get a little too close to their planets and be captured. And they might have been asteroids before. That's certainly the case with Phobos around Mars. Um, and even a little second moon we have at the moment that'll only be our moon for a few years before it moves on. It's, it's teeny tiny, way far away, but we've captured it with our gravity. We actually find the same basic elements. So far, we haven't found any elements out in space that we don't also find at Earth, and the most common elements on Earth tend to be the most common out in space. Um, and methane is very significant in these objects we looked at, but it's not actually that like in Neptune, the methane is less than 1% of the composition of Neptune. It just happens to be on the surface, so it affects the way that we see it. Um, but everything in the universe was formed inside of a star. And the most, well, except for hydrogen, and possibly a few other things. Um, but for the most part, everything was formed inside of a star. Um, and so smaller stars will form certain elements. Really big stars are needed to form uh, elements farther down on the periodic table. So things like gold, for example, are much more rare than things like methane and oxygen and uh, stuff like that. It also has to do with, yeah, that, that cloud of gas and dust that we all form from. And as that was forming, lots of chemical reactions were happening to change what was there left over from all the cool star stuff. And methane is actually a really common element for us to form in that, that primordial soup that we all came from. Yes, methane is the simplest hydrocarbon, which is materials that are made out of hydrogen and carbon. The methane is a single carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms stuck to it. We're pretty sure that the rocky, the, underneath this atmosphere, you do have a rocky planet, kind of like Earth, that we think is probably mostly formed out of rock with a, an iron core. Um, we've got mountains of ice, of frozen water, uh, lakes of methane. The atmosphere is a lot of methane, but also a little bit of oxygen, some carbon dioxide. Um, mostly nitrogen. Mostly mm -hmm. nitrogen. Just like the atmosphere on Earth, our air is about 80% or so nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> and so in a lot of ways, Titan is kind of similar to Earth, except for being very, very cold. And I'll also point out on the surface too, we have a very solid surface on Titan and it's made out of what seems like a rocky material, but it's actually water ice that's frozen so solidly that it acts like rock. When you're below 300 degrees Fahrenheit, things get a little bit crazy. So uh, we actually have water ice acting like rock on Titan.
So average temperature is about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So extremely cold. And one other thing we have to mention with Titan is the reason the atmosphere is so, like when you look at Titan from space or with the telescope, you will just see an orange ball. And that's because that atmosphere is really, really thick. And it's so thick that if you got a pair of wings and put them on your arms, you would be able to flap and you'd be able to fly through the air on Titan. I don't know. I'm still personally trying to sell this as the next hot vacation spot or cold vacation spot. You've got beachfront <laughs> property that's super abundant. The liquid methane and ethane lakes are really, really dense. So, and there's low gravity, so you could do cool jumps like dolphins. You could go gliding. I think this is a great place for vacation. Just need a lot of time to get there. So the moons around Saturn are named after the Titans. Right, Jose? Yeah, because Saturn... <clears throat> I'll let Jose take this one. <laughs> Saturn, uh, I, Saturn is Jupiter's dad. Uh, uh, in the Greek equivalent, where Jupiter is Zeus, Saturn would be Kronos, which is the king of the Titans, who ruled the land before Zeus did, or Saturn ruled the land before Jupiter did. So <clears throat> Saturn, uh, all of Saturn's moons are named after Titans from Greek mythology. This one is just called Titan, but it has other moons called Pr Prometheus, Atlas, things like that. The people in ancient Greece wouldn't have known that Titan was there because you can only see Titan with a telescope. You can't see it with your eyeballs. And so since they didn't have telescopes in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, they wouldn't have named this moon. These moons uh, were discovered, most of them were discovered and named at a time in history when people in science were like, man, Romans, they were just the best. We're going to have everything have a Latin name. So that's why a lot of things in medicine and science have Latin names. And that's why a lot of the moons around these planets have Latin names, because when they were first being discovered in the early days of uh, telescopic astronomy, um, those scientists were like, man, the Romans were just the best. Um, so that's why Neptune ended up with a Roman name and why so many of the moons have Roman names as well. And it's important to point out that the things that you can see without a telescope had different names all over the world. We've been looking up at Jupiter and Saturn and the moon and everything for thousands of years and people all over the world give different names. There's lots of different versions of constellations and uh, the pictures that people draw in the sky. And there was a time about 150 years ago when just a bunch of people in Europe got together and decided they were just gonna make all of the names standard so that everyone could talk about it. But <clears throat> there are a lot of other valid names for all these objects. Well, and now in science, we, are, we often name things differently now um, because now in science, we recognize that the names that other people had for these objects uh, is just as important as the names that we've given them. So as we discover new objects in our solar system and in our universe, we don't just use Roman or Greek names anymore. Now we are starting to use lots of different names from lots of different cultures and peoples. Do you know which star is closest to the Earth? If you guessed our sun, you're right. Our sun is a star. Now, when astronauts are orbiting Earth and they need to go out on a spacewalk, they need to wear a special suit to protect them from the rays of that very close star. Up next, we're going to hear from Naomi and Franklin all about the special parts of an astronaut's spacesuit. Hello everyone, my name is Franklin Cruz. I'm coming over here from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science with my friend Naomi, and we are both in our collections area. And Naomi, you're gonna be talking to us today about a really, really cool piece of equipment that astronauts actually use. Now, just to give people some context, when I walk out of my house, let's say today, or a shirt, don't have anything on my head, I don't have anything on my eyes, but Naomi, that's not the case for astronauts, is it? What do astronauts have to do to go outside of their homes? So it is pretty easy here on Earth. We are well adapted as humans to live here on our Earth. We have the right amount of air to breathe. There's a good amount of light. You might have to put on some sunglasses when you go outside or maybe a coat in winter, but it's pretty easy. But 
for astronauts, they need to bring their entire world with them every time they step out of the space station. And so that is what our spacesuit is, is bringing a little bit of Earth out into space to make it so that they can work in a pretty extreme environment. Now, my shirt is made out of like cotton and things like that. My jacket might be made out of something, but what is a spacesuit made out of? So this spacesuit is actually made up of 16 different layers of fabric. And there are layers there to keep the astronaut at the perfect temperature, much like your coat does to act like sunscreen to protect them from the sun's radiation, as well as protect them from space debris that might be floating around. So it's a really different type of material than what we would see on Earth. Okay, so, and then you said radiation, which makes me think like sun rays, right? Um, so in my car, I have that window and you know, people have uh, glasses, but I'm looking at the helmet on that. That doesn't look like the same kind of stuff my windows and glasses are made out of. So they actually do have two different visors on their spacesuit um, that are coated with metal to help protect them. And it really does act like sunglasses. They can see out around them, but the sun's rays are not gonna be too bright for them. And we're gonna protect them from that ultraviolet radiation, which is what we worry about when we think about sunlight. Got you. Now, let's say a lot of kids are, you know, um, at school right now on their computers and things like that, and they might have things um, in their material boxes, like maybe a journal or a crayon, some pencils, depending on what grade they are. But what kind of materials would an astronaut need? So just like school kids, astronauts need a backpack when they go outside as well. But their backpack carries something a little bit different. It's going to carry the air they need to breathe. Because mm. in space, there is no atmosphere, there's no air to breathe. So they have to bring that with them. So they'll have tanks of oxygen in their backpack. Awesome. Now, for school kids, um, they, their work might be like filling out worksheets, maybe mathematics. For you and I, it's uh, jumping on these Zoom calls to educate people. But what kind of work would an astronaut need to do? So most of the work astronauts do on the International Space Station is actually kind of like home repairs that your mom or dad might be doing. So they need to fix the space toilet. They need to keep the lights running, the air filters working. But sometimes when they go outside, they need to do bigger work, like replace batteries that require power. And that work is really difficult in a big bulky suit like that and with big bulky gloves like this makes it very difficult to be able to do that kind of work. Now, Naomi, when people are um, imagining getting ready for school, work, whatever, I mean, I took like maybe 20 minutes to really like choose my outfit, put it on, like get ready, you know, put my hair back, all that good stuff. How long would it take someone to put all that on? You said 16 layers? So the layers are mostly built into the fabric of the spacesuit itself, but they would actually need to put on the right undergarments to be comfortable, just like we do. And then the spacesuit actually comes in multiple pieces and it's gonna take them a couple hours with the help of another astronaut to get this on. So their pants would lock on with a metal ring to their torso or kind of their shirt. Same with their gloves and their boots, and then they need to get on the helmet. And so just like we choose different sizes of clothes to fit us, astronauts choose different sizes of their shirts or their torsos, their pants, and then the helmets are, are pretty standard, kind of like hats here on Earth. Okay, a quick question, because I was really interested. What are the little things on the side of the helmets? They look like, are they lights or what's? They are lights because the International Space Station is orbiting around the Earth once every 90 minutes. So imagine every hour and a half seeing a new sunrise and a new sunset. And so when an astronaut's out there for eight hours, potentially working on fixing uh, the outside of the International Space Station, sometimes there'll be sunlight, they need their sunglasses, but sometimes it'll be very, very dark out and they will need extra lights, kind of like a headlamp. Got you. Now, what's really, really cool to me is this chest piece that's going on right here. Like what's all that mechanical stuff? So this would have a lot of the readings they would need to understand what's going on with their life support. And if you'll notice, the writing's backwards. So if we think about us, yeah, I know you have a very cool DMS shirt on, you could just look down and read what's on your shirt. But for an astronaut, they can't move quite that way. So normally there'd be a little mirror on the inside of their gloves they could hold up and actually get the readings from their systems on the front of their suit. 
Nice. Well, Naomi, I guess my last question to you. Uh, what is so interesting about spacesuits to you? Well, these spacesuits were actually designed in the 1970s, and we've been using the same spacesuits for 40 years. And NASA is just starting to design all new spacesuits to send us to the moon with the Artemis program. So definitely take a look at those. They're colorful, and you'll notice a few different features because being on the moon is very different from being out floating in space around the International Space Station. Wow. Well, Naomi, thank you. This is very educational for me. I definitely am a person who's not super familiar with space, so getting to learn about this is definitely something that I enjoyed. Plus, it looks like you uh, took some time out of your day, so I appreciate that for coming to spend it with us. Um, again, this is Naomi, everyone, over here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. My name is Franklin. Thank you guys so much for participating with us, and we hope you enjoy your day. Have a great day. Hold on to your astronaut helmet. I just got the most exciting news. Do you remember Jose, Mitch, and Naomi? Well, I just learned that they're flying out of the solar system on their way to visit a nebula. Nebulas are clouds of gas and dust, and the nebula they're headed to is where a baby star is being born. All right, it's going to take us a bit to get out of our solar system, but we'll get there. Pretty I was going to say, speaking of naming things, what's this star called, Naomi? The sun? Oh, our proto star. Oh, my goodness. You're going to, hang on, let me get its official <laughs> name. <clears throat> it's a, a very exciting name uh, here. Let me see where our proto star is. Momentarily, you all chat while I pull up its name and, and get us there. So if Neptune and Titan are really cold and really far away from the sun, why is there still light there? Why, why are they lit up? So there is significantly less light. We've made them appear brighter in this program so you can see them. Um, but uh, once you get to Mars, which is about roughly 50 million miles farther away from the sun than we are, you get about half as much sunlight. By the time you get out to Saturn, it's about 1 25th of the sunlight that we get. So way out at Uranus and Neptune, it would actually be pretty dark. And if you looked back at the sun, it would be a pretty, it'd be brighter than all the other stars, but it would not look at all as bright as the sun from Earth. It would be a much, a big star, but not nearly as big as we get to see the sun. Um, so it's actually very dark out there, which is part of why it's hard to study. We really need to send spacecraft out there to get good information. And so we have a little baby star. Whose very exciting name is HH34. HH34. <laughs> um, it's called a Herbig Haro object, thus the HH. It's a very specific type of star that we see that is young, forming, and emits these really huge jets, which I think is pretty cool. But this is pretty likely what our sun looked like about four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago. Yeah, so what you're seeing here is the very exciting moment. Uh, at the beginning of a solar system where we had a huge cloud of gas and dust and little tiny things started going together. Something might have happened, like maybe another star blew apart and a shock wave went through, which caused things to start to swirl together. Um, but as more and more gas and dust starts to stick together and make a bigger and bigger ball, um, it starts spinning. Would you kind of imagine, have you ever taken two magnets on a table and put them close to each other? As soon as they click together, they spin. So you have a similar thing. Every little piece of material that gets added adds the energy, adds momentum um, to the spinning object. And once it gets big enough, it gets so big, the gravity gets so intense that at the center of this object, atoms, which really try to stay apart from each other, get crushed together. And this is what we call nuclear fusion. And when that happens, you get a nuclear explosion. And so once in the middle of a star, you start having nuclear explosions, that's when a star will actually uh, turn on, if you will. That's when it will become the sort of generator of light and energy and heat. <clears throat> um, and then meanwhile, this is, uh, the star has started to form. As millions and billions of years pass, other parts of this cloud will clump together into their own little balls and form planets and moons and things like that. As the star forms, um, and this is, by the way, we should point out, this is not a photograph. This is a computer-generated model, but it is a real object, and all of this, this image is completely based on things that we actually observe that are happening in HH2. 34. 
So, yep. <laughs> I'll see if I can pull us a real image from Hubble here real, as oh. you can be talking. So the big red disk around is um, just all of that other gas and dust that's spinning around and starting to clump together and forming planets and things. It's mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, there's a lot of other elements that will form together and form rock and water and all this stuff. Um, and the jets shooting off. Jose, tell us about those jets shooting out of that protostar. So those jets are an indication that this star actually just started shining. When you talked about nuclear explosions that happen inside stars, you talked about that's when the star starts producing heat, light, and energy. What happens is when that explosion first starts, the star shoots out a bunch of material. Now, stars are magnetic. They have magnetic fields, and their magnetic fields are much, 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 much stronger than the Earth's. They're very powerful. And so those magnetic fields, just like the magnetic fields on the Earth, are weak near the poles. So those magnetic fields take that material that gets shot out of the star and concentrate it at the north and south pole of the star. And then that material gets shot out into space in those big stellar jets right there. And so that's why you have those streaks on the top and the bottom. It's that's where the magnetic field from the star directed that burst of material when the star started, started shining. All right, and we have an image fading in here. So this is actually a real image of the object. I'm gonna shrink it down just a little bit if I can here. Um, it is, this is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is actually in the Orion Nebula, which is our closest stellar nursery, about 1500 light years away. And so you can see the image isn't quite as impressive. We don't have as much detail, but you can see that huge jet coming off of it um, down into the left. So this is what we actually see of the object. And then a scientist put together a visualization using scientific data from images like this and other data, and then gave that to us in this program called Uniview, which is pretty exciting. So this star is just fainter and smaller. Uh, stars we see in the night sky vary in brightness because of distance and size. So some of them are big blue stars that are young stars that have formed. Um, but they're typically further on in their growth. We're looking at a toddler star, basically. Those would be teenagers and adults. Um, we're pretty solidly middle age, 40 or so years old, if you were a human, our son is. Um, this one would be about a 10 year old. Um, and some of the stars we see in the night sky are like parents to grandparents age. And they're just different parts in their life and different sizes. And a lot of the, the brighter stars you see in the night sky, like the stars that make up the constellations, those stars are much, much bigger than our sun. Uh, most of the, the stars that are the size of our sun are actually too dim to see without a telescope in the night sky, unless they're close enough. Um, but most of the stars that make up the constellations are really, really big, really bright stars. There's a big variation depending on the star. Um, our sun, we expect to burn for about 10 billion years. Um, which we're about halfway through, so five billion years, which is a really long time. Um, and that's a pretty stable star. Cooler, smaller stars will last for much longer. Brighter, really hot, active stars will burn out more quickly. Um, but then it gets even more confusing because you might have a huge red supergiant and it'll burn out and it'll explode and it'll be a supernova and it might leave behind, well, might leave behind a black hole, but it also might leave behind a neutron star, which is a very hot, dense star. Um, that will last for a long time. So it's complicated is the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, we're still studying stars. And as we use our telescopes, we are fortunate because all of the stars that we observe are different ages. So we're able to observe baby stars like this. We're able to observe sort of middle-aged stars like our sun. We're able to observe older stars. We can see big stars, small stars, hot stars, cool stars. And as we study these stars, uh, what we do as scientists is we share this information with each other. We have other scientists check our work that's called peer review. And so we can start to come up with a big idea that encompasses stars. And that's what a theory is. So we use this theory uh, to talk about how stars form, how they live, how they die. And what, when we say die, what we mean is that the, sun, the star runs out of fuel. So what stars do is they take hydrogen and crush it in their cores into more complicated elements like helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. 
And the more stuff a star is made out of, the more mass it has, the more gravity it has. So it can make more complicated elements. Because it has more gravity and makes more complicated elements, it also tends to be hotter. So uh, that's sort of the, the way that we learn about stars, is still learning about stars. We're still learning about them, still studying. And you someday can, can make some breakthrough discovery about stars. You might find a star out there that nobody's ever seen before. The sky is filled with stars. And you have to give us some time because stars have been around for probably somewhere between 12 and 14 billion years. Um, wait, more than that. Uh, no, you're right, you're good. Yeah, okay, good. They keep updating the age of the universe on me. Um, <clears throat> whereas we have only been like, we had telescopes for like 400 years. So we've got a lot of time to catch up on stellar lifespans. In the case of stars, they have enough stuff and enough gravity that they can fuse, that they can crush hydrogen into more complicated elements. Even though the center of the Earth is really hot and the center of Jupiter is probably really hot, they don't have enough material or enough gravity to crush those elements and have that nuclear fusion. So that's what sets stars apart from moons and planets. They have so much mass, so much material, they have enough gravity to fuse hydrogen at their cores, and that's what makes them stars. And you know what's interesting is, in our solar system, there's a, there was only one clump big enough to become a star, but actually as we look out at more and more stars, that's kind of unusual. It's more common for a cloud of dust to form two stars that are orbiting each other, or even three, even more, and sometimes there are, we call those binary star systems. So in the center of a binary solar system, you'd have two stars circling each other and then planets circling those double stars, um, which would be a harder place to live. It's a good thing we only have one star. It leaves a much less variation in temperatures and conditions. It's much nicer. You may have seen a certain famous movie where a young boy named Luke lives on a planet orbiting two stars and sees two stars in the sky. Um, that would be a tough place to live. It's much nicer on Earth. And so I was trying to find that. Unfortunately, estimating size is really, really hard in astronomy. Uh, it depends on, we need to know exactly how far away it is, which in and of itself is a hard task to do. And then we look at how much uh, space it takes up in a picture. So. I can tell you how many pixels across it was in that old photo, <laughs> but that's not super helpful. Um, I was trying to find the, the length of the jets because that is really, really impressive. Um, those jets stretch out longer than, way longer than our solar system. Um, but I can't find the size of the star except for how many pixels in an image it was. So uh, this is one of the hard things with astronomy. To give you an idea, of the difficulty a star I studied when I was in school and I did my thesis on, we said it was somewhere between 200 and 700 light years away from Earth. So not very accurate because it, we're looking at how it wobbles and if we can't see the wobble of how it moves, we can't turn the distance and we can't figure out the size and that makes science really exciting and really fun to unlock all these mysteries and piece all those things together. The stars orbit, so yes. yes. Um, and in a binary star system, the stars orbit each other. Um, in our solar system, everything's going around the sun, but if you zoom out and you look at our solar system, the whole thing is spinning around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy are also spinning around. Um, and just like our solar system, the very most, the most massive thing, the thing with the most gravity is at the center. And in our solar system, that is a super massive black hole as well as a lot of stars. We're actually orbiting around the combined gravitational pull of everything farther in than us. Stars sure are amazing. Did you know that our nearest star, the sun, can be used to cook things? Up next, Franklin is gonna make some solar ovens out of pizza boxes. He's gonna test which solar oven melts different things like chocolate or candy the fastest.
Hello everyone, my name is Franklin Cruz and I'm coming from the Denver Museum of Nature Science here today to teach everyone a little bit about solar ovens, an at-home project that we are going to walk you through today. That way, in case you are at home with any kind of these materials, which are at-home materials, you'll be able to do this fun project. So here what we're going to do is we are going to take these regular objects that I found, which is just a box, some aluminum pieces, right? I also have some tape. You can use any kind of adhesive, glue, whatever you have at home. This is what I had at hand. A Little bit of a scissors. This is our pantry, per se. These are just some uh, foods that we had here at the museum. Really, you're gonna look for anything melty. So I have some marshmallows right here and some chocolates. They're gonna be for our s'mores the, um, experiment. I also have some other just regular cookie chocolate here for baking needs. I have some Jolly Ranchers and some pretzels. We're gonna try to make some chocolate covered pretzels if we can. And so I'm gonna be walking you through the steps. Um, you can modify any of this at home. If you don't have this kind of box, you can just use a milk carton, cut it open. You can use an old shoe box. You can use an Amazon box. You can use really anything that will form a box. If you don't have aluminum foil, but you have maybe some other kind of reflective craft material, um, we'll see in some other versions later on. I use some black paper just from what we had in our uh, cupboards over here. So anything that will intensify the heat, because again, we're going to make a solar oven. Now, what would we use to really power a solar oven, right? Well, at home, the thing that will touch everyone in the world is the sun. So that's what we're going to be using to uh, pretty much bake everything and utilize that heat is the sun from outside. So after I'm done with these, all we're going to do is on your porch, a window, anywhere where the sun is just beating down really, really hot because we're in an intense summer, then you can go ahead and use this solar oven. So let's go ahead and get started. So I already have my box here, whatever you chose to use. I'm gonna line the inside with some aluminum foil. Now these pieces, they were a little bit pre-measured just to make my life easier to teach you, but you can take your time at home and cut them out. I'm gonna line them, oops, switch them first because I put my bottom piece at the top. So here are my two pieces, and they're perfectly lined just to try to make sure that I can use as much of the surface inside to really reflect all of that radiation that's coming from the sun. As the sun beats down, it's just sending down these really, really strong heat rays, and the heat rays are just gonna be bouncing off of this, and whatever's sitting on top up here, it's just gonna cook. So now I have to secure these on, and that's where my tape and scissors comes in. So I'm gonna take a little bit of my tape right here, and I don't necessarily need to tape down the whole piece of aluminum sheet, but I do just want to make sure that it's not going to go anywhere. So I'm just going to put one piece right here at the back, just to make sure that this piece is not going to be flying anywhere at the bottom. I'm going to take another piece. And I'm going to attach my top piece right here, so that the whole box, or as much as this box as I can possibly get, is secured and covered in aluminum foil. That way, when we close this, it'll make a nice little oven on the inside. Now there's two versions that we're gonna make. I have some pre-made versions over here where we're gonna wrap our screen right around the front. This is the version I'm gonna show you how to make right here, which has a little window on the inside so that the sun can get inside. So in order to make this one, because otherwise we would be done. This is the easy, simple version, something that if you just want to do at home, don't want to spend too, too much time, make this version and you would just wrap your plastic around the outside. But here, we're going to close it. And in my box, I have some handy dandy little holes to help me out. But you could just take a scissors, a knife, anything really, and poke it through. And we're going to go ahead and Oops, gotta make sure also I cut my aluminum sheet. One more piece for security at the bottom. Okay. So now, cutting through the box just to make our window so that the sun can get into the inside. This is where adults, if you have little kids at home, definitely help them out. And as you continue doing this, if you cut your aluminum foil, it's okay. It doesn't have to be completely perfectly squared or framed by the window. As long as the majority of the box on the inside is covered in oil, you'll be fine. Or in oil, in foil. Don't cover your box in oil. That would be not conducive to an, a solar oven. Now, not gonna lie, 
Mine came out a little ugly, like I said. If this is what happens to you, it's perfectly fine. I might just have to splice this a little bit together with some tape and whatnot, but it's at home science, right? This is that piece. Later on, uh, once we put them outside, I'll probably surgery it up a little bit. But now the next step that we're gonna have to do is we're actually gonna have to put the cellophane window or the plastic wrap window. So I have some plastic wrap out here. Good luck to everyone working this at home. We all know the treachery of this thing. Tries to sabotage our life all the time, but not today. Today we did good. So I'm gonna put this on the inside. I like to put mine on the inside. It's just a little bit easier for me to work with. You can put it on the outside, doesn't really matter. This is just the window, however it attaches. So I'm gonna flip my box down just because I'd rather not have cellophane or cellophane flying through the air. I don't even know if that's how you properly call this. Cool. Got this tape, tear it in half. And again, there's pretty and ugly. So however this shows up, that's how it showed up today. We're doing our best. And for the most part, aside for some bumps and bruises, we have a pretty much functional solo oven. Now, here's some tips. Because I'm just showing you, I didn't really get to cover the corners. Here's my suggestion. Make sure that this is sealed as properly as possible. Because as you can see in my other one, here we'll have some plastic molds that we're gonna melt some things into. This is properly, properly sealed. This is to make sure that any heat around here is not gonna escape. This is, if you have the time, go ahead and make it look like this. If you just wanna do some fun things, you know, and you don't necessarily mind, go ahead and look like this. Many different versions that this can look like, um, but I'm gonna leave mine in here. Now, let's go ahead and visit our version two, just so we can see what that one would look like. Here's our version two. No window or anything, because the window's just gonna be the open front side. That looks like about the right shape. Again, I'm doing this winging it with my eyeballs. If you are doing the same thing at home, then you are at the same level as the Museum of Nature and Science, and I call that a success. I might have to, no lie, call my friend Amanda over here to help just because my hands are a little not enough. So let me go ahead and put this mask on real quick just for our personal safety. And then I'm gonna invite my friend Amanda onto the screen. Everyone say hello to Amanda. Amanda, if you can help me just hold this plastic while I tape it down. Cause again, plastic wrap does not wanna be everyone's friend. Thank you so much, Amanda. Cool, friends. This is why if you're at home and you can have a sibling help you, maybe a parent help you, that would be best. Cool. I'm gonna leave this side open because that's where I'm gonna have access to put in my materials and then we're gonna go put these outside. In this one, I'm gonna try my chocolate and graham cracker and see how it's gonna work. And now that Amanda's off, let me go ahead and take this mask off so we can go ahead and hear each other. So here's the open side. This is just for access so I can get my graham cracker and chocolate inside. I think in this one too, I'm gonna do the graham cracker and the marshmallow. See the difference of marshmallow versus chocolate in this one. So this experiment is set, marshmallow versus chocolate. On this experiment, um, we have some pretty fun little dinosaur molds. So in this one, I'm gonna do some candy melts. I have some red and white candy melts that I can utilize. So take some of the candy melts and I'm not necessarily trying to make perfect little molds. I just wanna see if the chocolate might melt. So have some candies in the candy molds. This is gonna go into the aluminum with the window. I have another one, which is black paper in the window. Just trying to see if there's a difference if we use aluminum versus black paper. In this one, let's go ahead and use some of the white ones. Oops, 
my fingers got stuck. Cool. So I got some white ones. I'm gonna pop those into some of the dinosaurs here. Cool. So now I have this experiment set. It's the same window box, one with black paper and one with aluminum. This one I'm gonna pretty up a little bit later. And then we have our graham cracker here. Let me clean my space, make sure it's nice and workable. And then in this one, we're just gonna do um, our Jolly Ranchers spot here. So we're gonna also experiment on some Jolly Ranchers, see what happens with aluminum foil and some hard candies, see the effects of those on this one. For these ones, I'm just gonna drop them right in. No one's gonna eat out of this box. And again, you can make as many boxes as you want. If you'd like to just reuse one box, that's perfectly fine too. You don't have to make four different boxes. This is just because we had the materials available here. Take the plastic wrap. Hopefully on this one, I'll be good enough to do it without having to call in Amanda. We're gonna create a smaller one. I'm gonna adjust my experiment on this one. Instead of making a big old cover, I'm gonna try to make a smaller cover on here. Just cause as I was figuring this out, I realized why make my life harder? Cool. So there's that little box. Oh, that was so much easier. Thank you, Amanda, but I think I've evolved past the need for help. Just do one top seal over here. All right, friends, for the most part, all four of my solar ovens are ready and set to go. They all have materials. I have different experiments, chocolates, mushroom, or mushrooms, uh, ma uh, marshmallow, um, and then some Jolly Ranchers. So the next process of this is we just have to take them outside and go ahead and seal them off. So this is just the last one I needed to seal off on here. Awesome, cool. I'm gonna put my mask back on and I don't have four hands, so I do have to call Amanda back up again just to help me with this one, just so that we can transport these outside. So, safety first. Amanda, if you can come help me carry two of these boxes and we'll just put two of them right outside. Well, thank you Amanda for helping me out. With that being said, uh, we will come check back in on our solar ovens just to see the progress of our experiments, chocolate versus hard candy, um, the ones with windows versus the ones with not windows, black paper versus aluminum, and see the results of that. So I'll see you guys then. Thank you so much, Amanda. Cool, friends. So we're back. Now that Amanda is off in her little corner of the studio, I can go ahead and take my mask off and we're gonna see the results of our solar ovens. So just to put them all in the same spot, here were my two different openings. So I had the full opening facing ones um, with just some um, tape to secure it on the side. I had my windows here. Both of them have a version with black paper or aluminum foil and they have different materials inside. So let's go ahead and start with our open facing solar ovens. So on the open facing solar oven with the aluminum foil inside, we have put some Jolly Ranchers and no lie, these Jolly Ranchers flattened out really, really nicely. So if I take a regular Jolly Rancher that we have from the bag, they're pretty uh, cylindrical, like a tiny, 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 tiny can. But these ones that I'm looking at right here, these are flattened out a little bit more like a pancake where they're not the most flat, but they're also not round anymore like a can. They are definitely squished down. And it looks like all five of my Jolly Ranchers squished down. So it looks like this solar oven was a pretty good success. Um, we had left them outside for a little bit under uh, or around an hour. So I feel as though if I would have left it out there for longer, this definitely could have just completely uh, liquid or liquefied all the way down to a tiny little pool of sugar water. Now let's compare this open face oven with the aluminum foil to the open face oven with just the black paper. In here we had our graham crackers with both marshmallows and chocolate on it. And I'm gonna tell you right now, 
both of those are incredibly, incredibly melty. The marshmallow, I can pretty much just push it down. It is just a gloppy little mess. And the same thing with the chocolate. The chocolate is just oozing all over the graham cracker. So it looks like our open facing uh, solar ovens, whether with black paper or aluminum foil, both do a really good job. Um, now let's go ahead and compare our uh, window oven. So this was, was one of the ones that I pre-made. We had even taped it down just a little bit to really give us some more security and make sure that the heat wasn't going anywhere. So give me a quick second to just open it up. Inside of here we have the chocolate um, with the molds of the dinosaurs on it. Ooh, this and if I open that one up, looks like our black paper, in all honesty, didn't really do too well with the chocolate molds. If I poke those chocolates, those chocolates aren't even really that soft. They're still pretty hard. So it looks like our window with the black paper, it's not the most effective, not gonna lie. Even with the really, really hot day outside, this didn't really melt too much. Let's check out our window with the aluminum foil. Same thing, here's our aluminum foil in our window. I got a little bit more meltiness on here, but the chocolates themselves can pretty much still keep their shape. They are pretty easy to squish, but overall they all look like they're, they just came out the bag. If I hadn't poked them with my finger, I don't think they would have melted anymore at all. So I wouldn't necessarily call this too, too much of a success, even though the chocolates are kind of melty. Um, they are still in their original shape, so they didn't really change too, too much. I wouldn't call this a success. Um, little things I can tell you that I didn't uh, really notice until I had gone out there. For one, it's just 98 degrees outside and these were in direct sunlight. Um, my question is, what if I put this in a hot garage with, or a closet where there's no sunlight at all? Would that kind of heat have changed anything? What if it was just a cooler day or I left them outside for less time, more time? Shadows, what if it would have rained for a little bit? What if I would have used different kinds of candy or butter or something? I still have some holes here on some of my solar ovens, so what if I would have made this a little bit better and just sealed it up a lot nicer? What if I would have used a plastic container versus a cardboard one, maybe a plastic bag? Maybe if I would have just left it out in the open. There's so many different experiments we can do with these things. The biggest one for this one, just find a container where you can create an enclosed space to create an oven, and then aside from that, see what kind of household items you can run experiments on at home. And hopefully you enjoy. Thank y'all. Well, they've visited a moon and they've headed out to a nebula. And now Jose, Mitch, and Naomi are headed back into our solar system. Before they get to Earth though, they're gonna take a swing by a big, beautiful blue planet. It's one of the gassy ones. Do you have a guess? If you said Neptune, you're right. Well, let's fly out to Neptune. Neptune is the first planet ever discovered by math. Uh, astronomers noticed that the orbit of Uranus wasn't quite what they would expect. And they tried to figure out what could explain that. And one thing that could explain it is there was another planet out there even farther away from the sun than Uranus. And they did the math, they figured out where it should be, we pointed our telescopes up there and we found it. So Neptune, discovered by math. And it's pretty exciting that we can go out to Neptune. We have only ever sent one spaceship anywhere near Neptune, and that was Voyager 2. And it flew by in the late 80s. So, wow, like 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago was the last time we got any really good photographs of the beautiful blue planet Neptune. Can I share my favorite Neptune fact? Yeah. Okay, so if you can get to Neptune, I will guarantee you, you are the richest person I know because there's so much heat and pressure on the inside of Neptune that carbon gets compressed down to diamonds. So we likely think, well, likely we think we would find raining diamonds down near the center of Neptune and maybe even diamond icebergs on this weird carbon ocean. That would be one heck of a piece of jewelry, a diamond from Neptune. <laughs> uh, Neptune, by the way, is named after the Roman god of the sea. And that's because look how beautiful and blue it is, just like the deep ocean. Um, but it is not blue for the same reason as the ocean. Um, 
Neptune is blue because though it is mostly made up, if it's a gas giant, it's mostly made up of gas, like hydrogen and helium, like 98, 99% hydrogen and helium. But the upper layers have a lot of a gas called methane. And methane is a gas that we have on Earth. If you have a gas stove, it probably uses methane. We call it natural gas. <clears throat> you can also find it in cow flatulence um, and also cow belching. There was a recent study, most of the methane cows produce is actually from belching. But anyways, this methane gas absorbs the red and yellow wavelengths of light. So the sunlight that hits methane, uh, sorry, that hits Neptune contains all the colors of the rainbow. And that gas absorbs the red and yellow wavelengths and reflects back the blue. So we see the blue light reflected off of Neptune. And that's why it's blue. Natural gas here on Earth is smelly. So somebody wanted to know if Neptune was smelly, but actually, uh, we add that smell to natural gas because it's dangerous and we want people to know that it's there. So Neptune is not smelly. It is not a stinky. Uh, That's true. Uh, Methane by itself doesn't, it's not a smell that humans really can detect. Um, but cow lot is also smelly because cows also add something uh, to the methane <laughs> that they release. So astronomers are very clever when it comes to naming things. And so we call that the great dark spot. Um, and what it is, is methane is a gas giant. So what we're looking at is mostly clouds. There's not a surface that you can see that you could stand on. If you tried to stand on Neptune, it'd be just like trying to stand on a cloud on Earth. You would just fall right through it. Um, and so among those clouds, there's a lot of uh, movement. And that dark spot is a huge hurricane. And Neptune actually has the fastest wind speeds we've ever recorded anywhere in the solar system. Um, wind speeds up to and maybe even beyond 800 miles an hour. So that is a huge spinning hurricane. But it's disappeared. So this was there when uh, we observed it with the Voyager spacecraft. Hubble has since tried to observe it. It disappeared, and then little storms seem to come back. So they're not these crazy long-lasting hurricanes like on Jupiter. So we, you would see lots of changing weather on Neptune if you were there collecting diamonds. I mentioned it doesn't have a surface you could stand on. And when we measure the, the temperature of a planet, we usually talk about the surface temperature, which on Earth, it's easy to tell where the surface is, because that's where you stop falling towards the center. On Neptune, that's harder to say. So we define the surface as the place inside of Neptune where the pressure of all the gases is about the same as sea level on Earth. Um, and at that point, Neptune is very cold. And Naomi, would you like to tell us how cold? It is about negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold out there. Not much sunlight reaching it at all. But then the deeper you go into Neptune, the hotter it gets. So the center of Neptune would be very, very hot, probably tens of thousands of degrees. Do you have that number at your fingertips, Naomi? <laughs> I don't because we actually don't know a ton about the core. We don't know exactly how much pressure and how much, how hot it is there. We have approximate guesses that it is obviously much hotter than the surface, whether it has a solid core or not. We don't know. That's one of the really exciting things about gas What was That's that? That's right, we don't, we don't know. It does have a magnetic field, which suggests that there might be a uh, metallic hydrogen or nickel iron cord. So the surface is cold because it is so far away from the sun. It's not getting energy from the sun. But when Neptune formed, uh, the process of forming of the material gathering together was very, very hot. Uh, all of the planets, when they first formed, like when Earth first formed, it was really a big ball of lava. And then the outer layers cooled off. And the inside of the Earth is still incredibly hot, regardless of how much sunlight is hitting it. And so that's true of Neptune, too, is the center is still incredibly hot from the formation. And because it is so massive, gravity is pulling everything towards the center. So there's an incredible amount of pressure in the center of Neptune. Um, and Something that physicists have discovered a long time ago is that if you take a material and you increase the pressure, the temperature increases as well. And so these little purple lines you're seeing are the moons of Neptune. The rings are there, but they're, they're small and thin and mostly made out of rocks, so they're hard to see. Um, but all these purple lines are moons of Neptune. And what is the naming strategy of Neptunian moons? They're named for the mythologi mythological children of Neptune. So they have uh, names like um, Calypso. Uh, and one of the most famous moons of Neptune is Triton, which if you've seen The Little Mermaid, that's Ariel's dad's name. Um, and Triton is actually a really interesting moon 
because it orbits the opposite direction of all of Neptune's other moons. So we think that Triton was actually an object that flew too close to Neptune and got captured by its gravity and then became a moon. Triton is also really interesting because it has geysers on it filled with liquid nitrogen. Gee, Neptune sure is beautiful. Do you know what else is beautiful? Comets. Let's go join Amanda as she teaches us a few things about these big, beautiful balls of ice. Hey everybody, it's Amanda and I am here to talk to you guys about comets today. But what is a comet? Comets are basically big, dirty snowballs flying around in space. Uh, most of the comets form way, way, way out in our solar system in a place called the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud. Now, unlike planets, planets make uh, more of a circular orbit around the sun, just like our Earth, right? Uh, comets take more of an elliptical orbit, so they start way out in our solar system and they start flying in towards our sun. Now, if they're big, dirty snowballs, as they get closer to our sun, that big, dirty snowball is going to start to melt. And that's where we see a comet's tail. So a lot of the times when you see uh, pictures of comets, you see a big tail flying out the back. That's because as it gets closer to the sun, it starts to melt and that tail gets longer. So it'll orbit the sun and then get flung back out into outer space. So we're gonna be exploring comets today. We're gonna to pretend like, I don't know, we are some sort of satellite, some sort of probe, and we've been sent out to study the composition of a comet, Comet Trelore. Now, for this activity, all you're gonna need is a balloon. Now keep in mind, you're gonna to need to start this about 24 hours before you wanna do the uh, composition study. So you'll need a balloon, and then you'll need some dirt and some water. And basically you're making a big muddy water balloon. So you'll fill this up with dirty water and then stick it in the freezer for about 24 hours. After about 24 hours, you get this big frozen ice ball. I have already uncovered one for you. So here's my snowball or my, my comet. You can see some of the dirt in there. It's already starting to melt because my hands are warm like the sun. All right, so you're, make sure when you do this, you have like a tray, like a cookie tray, uh, something that's gonna keep the water contained. And then you'll need tools. Now I'm not talking about like hammers and chainsaws. And we're gonna talk about kind of non-traditional tools today. And tools can be anything that you can find in your kitchen, uh, maybe a toy that you have, anything handheld that can help you explore our comet. So I have a straw, I have a, um, a sculpting tool for clay. I also have warm water with a pipette in it. Stick that over there. I have water with food coloring in it. And I've grabbed some salt today. You can also add sugar, you can add baking soda, uh, flour, whatever you wanna experiment with. So you're gonna use these tools to excavate or uh, study the composition of our comet. So you can add salt to it. What happens to our comet when we add salt to it? So you'll add some salt and then you can observe it. What do you notice happening? All right, to get a better visual, the reason why I like to do uh, colored water, so water with food coloring, is because when I add it to my comet, I can see that trail of where the salt melted the ice faster, a lot better than just putting clear water on it. All right, so let's add some warm water. What happens to our comet when we put warm water on it? So you're gonna try and excavate all of that dirt out of it. This is not an activity that you can just do with space or with comets. You can also freeze a Lego figure in an ice ball. You can freeze a dinosaur in an ice ball. You can freeze a piece of fur like part of a mammoth in an ice ball. And then you can use all these tools plus whatever you come up with at home to excavate those objects, your Lego or your dinosaur or your mammoth. All right, just again, make sure you keep it contained. It's messy, which is why we love it. All right, guys, have fun. Did you know there are remote control cars on Mars? Say that 10 times fast. Actually, 
They're not remote control cars. They're called rovers. And people here on Earth use computers to tell those rovers where to drive to on the surface of that red planet. It's a process called coding. Now, Amanda is going to teach Franklin and us how to play the coding game. Hey everybody, my name is Amanda. I'm here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and we're gonna talk a little bit about rovers today. As you may know, we just recently launched some rovers uh, to the surface of Mars and they should get there on February 18th, my birthday. So happy birthday to me. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how those rovers work. Rovers are actually like giant remote control cars. And if you've ever played with a remote control car, you know that you have to tell that car where to go by using its remote. So a rover on Mars doesn't just go somewhere. We have to tell it where to go. So well, let's explore a little bit about coding through my coding mouse. And then we're gonna play a really fun game called Mission Control. And that's where you're gonna bring in a friend and play or practice your own version of coding. So check this out. Down here, this is my surface of Mars, and this here is my little rover. Maybe some of you have seen one of these guys, they're little coding mice. Um, so I wanna tell my rover to get to, let's say I want it to get to the purple number one. I can't just say, hey mouse, go to purple number one. I have to tell it exactly what to do. So if I want my mouse to move forward, I need to tell it to go forward. Now, I actually also have to tell it to turn right. So if I want my mouse or my rover to go this way, I need to tell it to go that way. So I'm gonna say, mouse or rover, turn right. And that guy's gonna turn right for me. Now, if I want him to go all the way to one, I want him to move forward two blocks. So one, two. So I'm gonna clear him and I'm gonna press one, two. He's gonna move forward two blocks for me. Uh-oh, I've got an obstacle. I need to go around that obstacle. So I'm gonna tell my rover to turn left. And then I have two blocks to get to purple number one. So I'm gonna go one, two, and press green. And that's exactly how rovers on Mars work. We tell them exactly what we want them to do. So let's play a little game called Mission Control. I'm gonna call my friend Franklin in here and I'm gonna tell you guys exactly how to play because you're gonna need a buddy for this. So we'll slide this out of screen. And then there's Franklin. Hi Franklin. Now Franklin, I'm gonna have him start uh, on that, take one step to your left, buddy, right there. Now you're gonna pick an object. It can be anything. It can be a stuffed animal that you have at home. It could be a figurine that you have in your house, like a G.I. Joe, a Barbie, uh, whatever. I have chosen a rock. This game can be done inside or it can be done outside. So I'm gonna take my object and I'm gonna put it somewhere on the ground. Now Franklin is gonna be my rover. Franklin, has eyes, but rovers don't. So I'm gonna tell Franklin that he, he has to close his eyes. No cheating. Keep them closed, I see it. Close them. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna tell Franklin how to get to this rock right here, but I have to be very specific about it. I can't just say, Franklin, go to the rock because he doesn't have eyeballs, so he doesn't know where it's at. So I need to be very specific with him. I'm gonna say, Franklin, move forward two steps. Now I need to get him over here, so I want him to turn. And I'm gonna say, Franklin, turn right. All right, Franklin, take four steps forward. Oh, that last one was small. You're cheating on me. Franklin, take one more step forward. Franklin, take one more step forward. Franklin, reach down, collect sample. And now I want him to tell Mission Control or me um, 
what, he, what sample he's collected. I want him to analyze that object. So I'm gonna say, Franklin, analyze object. Well, it's small, you can fit in my hand. It's not smooth, it's pretty rough. It's got some jagged edges, it's not round. It kind of feels broken in spots. It's not hot or cold. It's not heavy, but it's not light. I think it's a rock. Excellent. So you want your rover to analyze the sample. You want them to try and figure out what that object is that you had them collect. So now you have them collect the sample. You're gonna have them put that sample back down. So Franklin, put the sample down. And then I wanna bring my rover all the way back to where it started. So Franklin, turn left. Franklin, turn left again. So now I have him facing where I want him to go. Franklin, take four steps forward. And now I need him to turn left again. So Franklin, turn left. Franklin, take two steps forward. <laughs> Don't run into the astronauts. <laughs> but I got him back to where he started. And now you guys can flip, uh, flip places. So whoever was the rover becomes mission control and mission control becomes the rover. So that's just a super fun game that you guys can play at home. And again, it can be done inside on a rainy day or it can be done outside. Wow, that was a really fun game. Did you laugh? I know I did, but of course, Franklin knows we were laughing with him, not at him, right? We have one more fun thing to do on our exploration of space today. Amanda is going to go talk with Evelyn. Evelyn is one of the people at the museum who helps take care of our collections. Evelyn is going to tell us about some very special rocks at the museum. These rocks are called meteorites. Hey, Ev. Hey. Hey, everybody, it's Amanda. I am here in our education collection space. Um, and I am with our curator or our, I guess, manager, our manager of education collections, Evelyn Bush, the purveyor of all things scientific and awesome. We are here talking about meteorites or asteroids or meteors. Let's just start there, Evelyn. What is the difference between an asteroid, a meteor, and a meteorite? So asteroids are the things that you actually, well, you don't see often. They're the things that fly through space. Um, they're just a hunk of rock. I have a model of one here. In real life, this one's bigger than Denver. Um, but these are just hunks of rocks that are floating around our solar system, our universe, usually interacting with nothing because space is a whole lot of nothing. It's not until one of these guys uh, starts to interact with our atmosphere that the friction in the atmosphere causes it to light up. And when it does that, that is what you see as a meteor, a shooting star across the, st the sky. If that thing doesn't burn up entirely in our atmosphere, it lands on Earth. It goes boom, crash, sparkles on Earth. That's the meteorite. It has to hit the Earth to be considered a meteorite. So during meteor showers, when we see those, those shooting stars, those are actually space rocks flying through our atmosphere and getting get it like super duper hot and it looks like an alien shot a star across the sky? Yes, exactly. So it's friction. Space is a bunch of emptiness. It's a vacuum. There's really little, uh, if any, friction out in outer space. But our atmosphere is kind of like the difference, like if space was water, our atmosphere is like a milkshake. It's thicker. So as stuff starts to try to move through that really high rates of speed, something called friction builds up. So if you put your hands together and you start rubbing them together really fast and faster and faster and faster, you notice your hands get hotter and hotter as you go. Now imagine that's a rock flying at thousands of miles an hour through outer space and it hits suddenly something very thick. It starts to warm up just like your hands did. And it gets hot enough that it actually starts to melt and glow. And that's what you see in the atmosphere. So is that why this one that I'm holding in my hand right now kind of looks burnt, like somebody left a hot dog on the grill for too long? 
Yep, that burnt, melted a little bit. And even the one you have, Amanda, you can tell which direction it was falling because it's kind of teardrop shaped. And so as it falls, it's kind of melted and pulled itself backwards into the shape of a teardrop. So you can see the shape and the angle it came in at the atmosphere. Got it, got it. So Evelyn, I'm noticing as I'm holding this, this meteorite that it's pretty heavy. And there are different types of meteorites, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about the, the different types? Yeah, there's basically three types of meteorites. A nickel iron meteorite, which is a mixture of the metals, nickel and iron, nickel like in the coin. And so iron, like you might find in your car, we can, you, hit, you make those hot enough, you can mix them together. Um, there's stony meteorites, where literally, they're just rocks um, okay. from outer space. And then you can, you can have a mixture of the two. You have a stony iron meteorite. And that's both of those in one together. We'll look at one later. Okay. Let's just get into it. Can you okay, show us an example? I know that this one, because it's so heavy, I'm assuming that this one is a nickel iron. Meteorite. That is a nickel iron meteorite, yes. yes. All right, do you have a stony one that we could check out? Do I have a what? A stony meteorite. A stony meteorite, yes. Somewhere. <laughs> you got a lot of drawers to go through. Here. So this is a fragment of the Allende meteorite that fell in 1969 in Mexico. And it is just, you can see there's no evidence of being metal. It's just a rock. And Amanda, you actually have one that's cut for the same meteorite. So this fall was a bunch of like pebbles that came down. And if you look at Amanda's, um, let me see if I can do a better shot here. Does this show up better? I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that one looks really good. So here you can see a whole bunch of little tiny, what they call chondrules. And these are fragments of basically space dust from before the solar system was a solar system. We didn't have planets yet. This is what we called a nebular cloud. Um, so this is actually older than Earth and older than our solar system. It's about seven billion years old. So those little gray specks are like pre-solar system dust? Yep, pre-solar system planets dust. weren't even thought of yet? Nope. That's insanely awesome. So there's a stony meteorite. I'm not sure if it can get cooler than that, honestly. But I'm sure you have something cool. So there's a third type, right? There's, there's a mixture. Third type. And this is when we literally mix the stony meteorites and the nickel iron meteorites together. This particular one's called a palisite. And you can see the metal, which is the gray shiny stuff here. And then these brown bits are olivines. And Amanda actually has a nicer piece oh. of meteorite that's been cut and polished. And you can see really well. So olivine is a volcanic material. So this is, these are basalts that we're seeing. And um, we have olivine here on earth. We make jewelry out of it. And if you've ever been to Hawaii, it's the green sand on the beaches. Um, so Amanda, if you take the flashlight you have and like put it up behind them, you can actually see these olivine crystals glow a bright green. What? That's so cool. So, how can we tell if something's a meteor or a meteorite or not? Because, I mean, honestly, when I look at this stony meteorite, I can't tell the difference between this one and a regular rock here on Earth. So how do we know? So we use a lot of different things for evidence. Um, but a couple ways that we can tell almost immediately if something is or is not a meteorite is looking at some characteristics. And the one you held up earlier, Amanda, the teardrop-shaped one, if you hold that up um, nose first to the camera, I don't know if the camera's gonna be able to pick it up, but there's tiny lines on there that are, that are called uh, ablation lines. And those are like raindrops on your windshield when it's raining, like they're moving up. But this is molten meteorite that's moving around the nose of the meteorite as it melts. Yeah. Almost, so we look. Guys, honestly, it looks like the tip of a hot dog. Like those lines. I know I'm making a lot of hot dog references here, but that's kind of what it looks like. Um, another way we look at, another thing we look at, look for, um, with the stony meteorites is something we call a fusion crust. And that it happens when the outside of the rock is cooked with uh, the heat from the atmosphere. So I, on this one, I'm trying to hold it up here and see if we can get a good view of it. You can kind of see this dark black that's here. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this little tiny layer that's sitting on top. 
And Amanda, I think you can see it on yours yeah. as well. You can see the gray underneath and the dark black on top. That's the fusion crust. This this part here. This Got is it. On top. So that's another thing we look for in identifying whether or not something is a meteorite or not. So those are two ways we can tell pretty quick. Another way, especially for nickel iron meteorites, is they're really heavy. That's true. Those are those are pretty hefty hefty uh, objects there. All right. So we've learned about the three different types of meteorites. We've learned how to tell the difference between the meteorites, all right, and how to tell if it's a meteorite or not. So to end this, we're going to play a little game I like to call meteorite or meteor wrong. I'm going to show you some objects, and I want to see if you can figure out whether they are meteorites or meteor wrongs. Are you ready, Evelyn? Only if I can play on my end, too. OK. All right, I'm gonna show you two objects. You have to figure out whether they are meteorites or meteor wrongs. Here comes the first object. I don't know, is it, is it heavy? Yes, it is, it's extremely heavy. Does it feel like really dense, is it hard? Yep. <laughs> does it look like it's been cooked? Sure does. So I'm going to go with that's a meteorite. That is correct. All right, here comes your second one. I'm not sure on this one. Is has the outs has the outside been cooked? <laughs> uh, it hasn't. Um, is it heavy? Not really. I mean, it, it looks kind of. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, like the shape, but I'm going to go with meteor wrong. You're right. This is a carrot, a plastic carrot. All right, you give me, you give me two okay. objects. Meteor right or meteor wrong. That looks like a cow pie. It looks like <laughs> poop. I'm going to say no, meteor wrong. This isn't, it is a meteor wrong, but it is not cow poop. This is something we call concretion. And a lot of times we open these up and you find them and they're round, but you open them up, you crack them in half and they're hollow on the inside. There's a space for air. And what don't we have in space? Air. So we know this isn't from space. All right, give me another one. One more. I'm ready. I got my thinking cap on. All right, ready? I'm ready. One, two, three. Um, Meteor wrong. Is it, is it heavy? Not anymore. Huh. Does it look burnt? It's been cut. <gasps> Cheaters. Um, I am going to say meteor wrong. Meteor wrong. Unfortunately, you are wrong. <gasps> this is a meteorite, but it's not just any meteorite. This is a Martian meteorite. This is from Mars. So a meteorite slams into the surface of Mars and blows a bunch of chunks of Mars up into space. And one of those chunks from Mars finds its way back here and lands in North Africa in like 1991. You so are this, holding, is, this is a piece of Mars. You're holding a chunk of Mars I'm in your chunk hand of Mars right in now. In my hand, right now. My mind, there you go. this one, it blew up. I think we need to end it on that super awesome bit of collection you have in your hand. So thanks so much, Evelyn. I think we've all learned a ton about asteroids, meteors, and meteorites. Um, we will let you get back to your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, see you later. Bye.
friend and this is Wally. Hi friends, I'm Wally, nice to see you. And today we're gonna talk about the feeling proud. How you doing Wally? Well, I'm good, yeah. Can I tell you about something? Sure, tell us Wally. Well, we have this skateboard in our house. It's my sister's and I really, really wanna learn how to ride it. So yesterday I took it outside on the sidewalk cause my sister said I could use it and I kept stepping on it and then falling. Every time I got on the skateboard, I would just fall right over. Hmm. <sighs> Didn't feel very good. Couldn't do it. But guess what? What, Wally? I remembered to smell the flower and blow out the candle. <sighs> so I took three deep breaths like this. felt a little calm. What'd you do next, Wally? Well, once I felt calm, I thought of an idea. I asked my sister for help. That's a really good idea, Wally. What'd she say? She said yes. So she went outside with me and she held my hands while I got on the skateboard and we tried it over and over and over and over again. And finally, I figured out how to do it all by myself. Wow, that must have felt really good, Wally. Yeah, I could stand up straight, felt like a really big kid. I felt really good about myself. I felt proud. Oh, that's a really good feeling, Wally. Yeah, when we can do something all by ourselves, we've tried really hard. Yeah, Wally, I'm also really proud that you remembered to take three deep breaths. Yeah, I'm proud of myself too. I remembered to take deep breaths, and I learned to skateboard. Wow, that's lots of things to be proud of. That is a lot of things to be proud of, Wally. Can you guys say that word, proud? Nice job. That's when we feel really good about something that we've done. Sometimes we're, our shoulders go back and our chest comes out. We feel like a big kid. Yeah, that's a good feeling, Wally. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever felt proud? Hmm, I have. One time I feel proud is at the end of the day when I've gotten all my work done and I'm all done for the day and I've done a good job. I feel really proud. Yeah, that's cool. Wally, we have some friends who would like to share with us when they felt proud. Would you like to hear? Yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, let's listen to these other kiddos. Okay. I'm proud of myself that I'm being kind. I'm proud I can do my name. I'm proud that I finished my schoolwork for the day. I'm proud that um, I finished my dance recital after months of training. That was kind of fun to hear about what other kids were feeling proud of, wasn't it, Wally? Yeah, I really liked that. You guys at home, when do you feel proud? That's right, so proud can be when we do something all by ourselves, like maybe you learn to ride a bike all by yourself or make a snack for yourself or get dressed all by yourself. We can also feel proud when we've tried to do something for a long time and we can finally do it. Like maybe we finally learned to read or we finally learn how to do our math or maybe we finally learn how to zip our sweatshirt up. Yeah, those are some things to be proud of. Think for a second, when do you feel proud? We all feel proud sometimes, don't we, Wally? Yeah, yeah. So Wally, I brought some more pictures for you. The first one is right here. Oh yeah, I remember that. That is frustrated. When were you feeling frustrated, Wally? I was feeling really frustrated when I couldn't ride the skateboard. Hm. But then I remembered to take deep breaths and I thought to ask my sister. That's right, Wally. And then how did you feel? Oh yeah, I felt proud. Everybody show me your proud faces. Nice job, I like those proud faces. Yeah, me too, it's kinda like a happy face. It is, Wally. So for the adults at home, it's really awesome when we tell our kids that we're proud of them, but it's also really neat for kids to recognize when they've persevered or overcome a challenge and are feeling really proud of themselves. 
That's right, Wally. What else? Um, oh yeah, I remember. Feel your feelings. That's right. And after this, Wally, these guys get to see Juan and Emily, because I think Juan is feeling proud about something too. Oh, awesome. All right, see you next time. Bye, friends. See you soon. <gasps> oh, hi, it's you. I'm so happy to see you. Guess what? You know how we've been working on taking deep breaths and going to our happy places when we're feeling mad or frustrated? Well, I got to tell you something. It actually works. Juan, of course it works. I want to be teaching you something that wasn't backed up by years and years of hard science. Yeah, I know. It's just that something really cool happened. So, last night, Tabo and I were in the living room watching TV. And you know how Tavo is. He always wants to watch science shows. Well, I wanted to watch cartoons. So I told him. And he said, well, I got there first. And I'm the older brother, so we'll do whatever I want. Do you guys have brothers and sisters like that? So you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I could feel myself getting mad. My face started to get hot and my fists started to clench up. And I thought, whoa. I better take some deep breaths. So I took some deep breaths, but I was still feeling mad. So I decided to try my happy place. So I went to my room and I got out my picture of my happy place and I closed my eyes and I saw the huge rides at Legoland and I smelled the popcorn and the cotton candy and I could feel the bricks in my hands and you know what pretty soon I wasn't thinking of Tavo and I wasn't thinking of the TV I was just thinking of Legos. So I got my Legos out and I started playing. It was awesome. Ron, you must feel so proud. Proud? What's proud? Well, proud or orgulloso is when you're doing something that's really hard and you keep trying and you keep trying until you finally get it. And then you feel so happy and so warm and you have a big smile on your face. That's what feeling proud is. Well, yeah, then I guess I did feel proud because I felt so good. Si se pudo. Wow, Juan, si se pudo. Well, let's ask some of the kids out there if they've ever felt proud. I felt proud when I made mac and cheese for the first time. I'm proud when I put my hand to a ponytail all by myself. I'm proud that I can read in Spanish. Wow, Juan, it seems like a lot of kids out there have felt proud before. Yeah, it's a great feeling, right? Well, Juan, one thing that I've been feeling super proud about is the fact that we've been in our house for almost two whole months now. We've only left to go to the grocery store or to go on a walk. That and the fact that we're wearing masks means that we're keeping people healthy and safe. And that makes me feel really proud. Yeah, me too, grown-ups. Be sure to let your kids know when you feel proud of them and help them learn to feel proud of themselves. 
You can say, wow, that was really hard, but you did it. How do you feel? And remember, feel your feelings. Okay, let's wash up. Okay. Bad wind up. Bye-bye, germs. I'm washing you all away. Wouldn't it be funny if we could see the germs go away? Hey, want to make believe with me? Let's make believe that we get rid of all the germs. this afternoon with a friend from school. Oh, Molly, that sounds really fun. Yeah, his name is Henry, and he really likes space, like I do, and we both like Legos, so we're gonna get our Legos out, and he's gonna be on Zoom, and so am I, and we're gonna play with our Legos together on a video call. Molly, that sounds like a great idea. I'm excited for you. Yeah, I know, me too. Um, Molly, tell me about Henry. Well, Henry is really, really friendly and he has an interesting family. Oh yeah, what's interesting about his family? Well, he has foster brothers and foster sisters at home. Oh. Yeah, Molly, I know about foster families. You do? I do, Molly. I was a foster mom for a while. Oh, wow. Well, maybe you could tell me about that. Well, sure, yeah. Foster families take care of kiddos when their parents need some time to solve some problems at home. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Most kids who live with foster families just live for foster families for a little while, maybe a couple of weeks or a few months, and then they get to go back to their families. Oh, well, that sounds kind of scary. Molly, you're right. It's very scary to live with a new family, right? Foster families try really hard to help kids be comfortable and feel safe but it's really scary to have to go move into a new home with a new room and different rules, different food, different people. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know about that. Lindsay, it seems like you'd have to be really brave to be in foster care. Molly, you are exactly right. Sometimes it's hard to be brave, but kids who are in foster care, they have to be brave even when they don't want to be. There are a lot of scary things you have to figure out. Going to a new school can be scary. Yeah, wow. I wonder if, if Henry's foster brothers and foster sisters seem really brave to him. I bet that Henry can see when his foster siblings are being brave, yeah. And it takes bravery to be Henry too and to have new kids come and live in your home, right? Oh, yeah, I guess Henry has to be brave too. Mm-hmm. Grown-ups in the room, 
There are kids all over the country in foster care all the time. And Molly's exactly right. They are scared and brave. Sometimes it's hard to talk to our kids about the experiences that other children are having that we're not familiar with. It's great to do research together. You can get a book from the library or look online and find more information about experiences of foster families or children in foster care and talk to your kids about it so that you better understand the experiences that other children are having. Molly, what else do we want to say? Remember, feel your feelings. It sucks having not be able to go to school and um, not talk to your friends, you know. Staying at home sucks because I don't get to see any of my friends in person. You're right, this does suck, it's hard. Maybe you're used to seeing your friends every day at school and now you haven't seen them in a while and that's a huge loss. My mom wouldn't even let me go to the store with her and all I needed was just to get out of the house. It's gonna be really hard not to do that anymore. It's important to know why we are physical distancing. So physical distancing is helping to reduce the number of people getting sick at once. We're still able to touch base with our friends through FaceTime, Zoom, or other virtual platforms. And know that your friends are in similar situations and are also at home. To learn more, talk with a parent or ask them to go to rmpbs.org. Now, you're in the know.